a devotional book on the Beatitudes. They're available back on that table. These devotional thoughts have kind of shaped this sermon series. They were the, the inspiration of what I've been doing, and Stant and I have been talking about these as we go along, and kind of, you know, as I kind of say something, he comes back, and, um, you know, he's, he's kind of giving me some affirmation and knowing that I'm not screwing up what he's doing, okay? He's kind of letting me know that things have been, that, that, that I haven't misinterpreted him or or misread that. But if you would like to pick up a copy of this, it's, it's available to you. Uh, we have a limited number, so if you already have one for your household, please leave them for the others. But if you're a guest with us, we want you to go ahead and pick one up also. Um, it is a, a great word of, of affirmation and comfort, so please feel free to pick one of those up. You don't have to have read it to follow along with the sermon series. In fact, what I'm going to do right now is kind of catch you up on everything. There have been two sermons so far. In the first two sermons, I kind of brought in the, the, the contrast that the, the word blessing is really the thing that we're concentrating on in this sermon series. And the contemporary church use of the word blessing, we have used it and defined it by uh, talking about how fortunate we are or how lucky we are or how prosperous we are. That's how we use the word blessing in the church today. But in the Old Testament... It wasn't used that way. Even in Jesus' time, in the Roman culture, this is how the word would have been interpreted by the Romans. But for those who were steeped in the Old Testament, for those who had kind of come through the stories of, of Moses and Abraham and David and all of those, blessing had a different meaning to it. In the Old Testament use of blessing, we see three things. One is that it's a future potential. Two, that future potential draws on a greater reality. And that greater reality and that blessing is grounded in God's original blessing of fruitfulness and multiplication, filling, subduing, and ruling. When Jesus preaches the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5 and Luke chapter 6, those words are not grounded in the contemporary use of blessing. They're grounded in the Old Testament use of it. They're grounded in what was the original understanding of a blessing so that when he preached to these people the words blessed are it's not talking about how fortunate it are how fortunate they are how lucky they are how prosperous they are jesus is talking about what potential did the kingdom of god have for them that was grounded in that original promise so there you go just caught you up on the sermon series so far this morning i want to read from deuteronomy chapter 28 Deuteronomy chapter 28 comes at the end of the wilderness wandering. The people of God have, have wandered through the wilderness. They're coming to the end of that journey. They're, they're looking across the Jordan into the promised land, and Moses is pronouncing his, his really his final statement on what God can do for the people. Deuteronomy chapter 28, beginning at verse 1. Now it shall be, Moses says to the people, if you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. Blessed are you in the city, and blessed are you in the country. Blessed are the offspring of your body and the produce of your ground and the offspring of your beasts, the increase of your herd and the flock, the young of your flock. Blessed are your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed are you when you come in and blessed are you when you go out. The Lord shall cause your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way, and they will flee before you seven ways. The Lord will command the blessing upon you in your barns and in all that you put your hand to, and he will bless you in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Will you join me in a spirit of prayer? God, as you called the people out of Egypt and put before them the vision of a new land, a land they could call home. There had to be excitement and energy and joy and hope. And then for 40 years, they wandered, lost in their connection to you, losing sight of the promise 
of the land of blessing. But then they arrived. And they saw that you were faithful. You invited them to come in with the promise of more blessing. But there was one word of condition. If you will obey. God, as we have been filled with so many marks of prosperity and fortune or luck, our lives truly do appear to have been blessed. But what do you call us to do with all of the blessings we have? What responsibility to do, to do we bear out? For we have been blessed. In this message, may my words be yours, that I would speak wisdom and truth according to your will and your word. May our hearts and minds our lives be humbled before you almighty God to seek your will to do as you obey and to extend the blessing that we have received into the world around us I pray these things in your name Father, Son and Spirit Amen in the Old Testament here in Deuteronomy we we see this list of blessings that really does sound a lot like what Jesus says in the New Testament. Blessed are you when? Blessed are you in this place? Blessed are you in this circumstance? Blessed are you? And this is what you will experience. We, we kind of hear an echo of it when Jesus pronounces the blessings over the people in the Beatitudes. But here in Deuteronomy, we don't have this idea again of fortune or, or, or luck or prosperity. Now, it sounds like it on the surface, but remember where the people are, okay? This is the, this is the river, that's the promised land, they're on this side. They're not there yet. And if you remember your story of the Old Testament, once they get across the river, it takes a little while to make it the land of promise. It takes a lot of work to get that land to where it will produce the blessings. But the big thing is, is that overall in these blessings, in, in Deuteronomy, everything that, that, that God is promising through the mouth of Moses to the people says, I'm going to bless you this way and this way and this way and this way and, and, and you're going to get this and this and this and this. Over all of that, or maybe I should say under all of that, is one condition that is repeated two times. If you diligently obey the Lord your God, being careful to do all of His commandments which I command you, then the Lord will do this. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. In Deuteronomy, blessing has responsibility. If the people want to receive the blessings, if the people want to live with all of these blessings in that land which God had promised them, it was required of them to do what God said do. Now Jesus, I think, is not only kind of giving us a little bit of a, a parallel to the Old Testament, I think he also went so far as to pronounce his blessings with responsibilities also. When you read through the Beatitudes, you find two types of people noted. The first are those who are blessed because of what they experience. The poor in spirit, the, those who mourn, the gentle, the persecuted. They experience those things. They are blessed because of that. But Jesus also says, blessed are people because of what they do. There's the hungry and the thirsty for righteousness. There are the merciful. There are the pure in heart. There are the peacemakers. Those are people who do things. And that's who we're going to concentrate on today. We're going to concentrate on those people who are doers of blessing. Because Jesus singles them out in such a way to kind of make it seem like there might be some responsibility attached to the idea of blessing. 
So we have four groups of people. We have, we have the hungry, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, those who are merciful, those who are pure in heart, and those who are peacemakers. I'm going to go through each one of these and show you how these are doers of the blessing. First are the hungry and the thirsty. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does it feel like to be hungry? You're exactly right. Most of us in this room have never experienced hunger. Most of us have experienced habit. That feeling that we get right about here at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's not hunger. That's habit. Hunger is something that we don't experience on a regular basis. We have the benefit of living in a very lower middle class, middle class, upper middle class church. We don't have the poor. We don't have the hungry right here. So when I ask you, what does it feel like to hunger? I think Luana is exactly right. We don't know what hunger is like. We don't know what that hunger that is a craving for something that you so desperately need, that you're willing to take whatever you can get. Most of us, we don't know what we want. We open up our cabinet and we have so many different varieties and choices, we don't even know where to begin. Do I have a snicker? Do I have a Milky Way? Most of us don't go for fruit. The Cheetos, all right. But the Greek word here for hunger is that, that idea of craving ardently, that desire that is so strong that anything that is edible that comes in your way, you're willing to eat it. We've not gotten there. And also, we don't know what thirst is. We don't know what it means to be so thirsty that it hurts to drink, that it hurts to swallow, that it hurts to experience something being in our throat. That's the Greek that we're seeing there. To be so hungry that you will eat anything as long as it's edible and to thirst so painfully that even to swallow causes pain. And now Jesus says, that kind of hunger and that kind of thirst for righteousness is blessed. Righteousness is a weird word. We have a, we have a hard time getting people to define it. Stant uses the, the original Greek word, diakosune, to mean justice. And it does mean that. Justice means to make right in the world. To make right for everyone. That is what justice is. I take it to the, to the bigger meaning. Righteousness is doing a life that is worthy of God or Christ. For the Old Testament, righteousness was the idea of living in such a way that you were in a right relationship with God. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 1. If you obey the commandments, then God will do this. That's righteousness, obedience to the commandments. Living that life in connection with God. Righteousness. In the New Testament, we understand that living a life worthy of Christ is what righteousness is. And so we have to ask ourselves, what does that look like? Well, think about it this way. Think about who Jesus is. What makes Jesus, Jesus? If we want to be in a relationship with him, we have to live in a way that is like him. We have to live in a way like Jesus is Jesus. Being like Him. Doing like Him. Striving to, to, to fulfill the Father's will. And here's the kicker. We do not separate God in Christ. We are still in that relationship. We're still trying to get in that relationship with God. But for Christians, we are in a relationship with God through Christ. If we want to know God, if we want to be in that relationship, if we want to be righteous according to God, we come through the righteousness of Christ. So we live like Christ to be in that connection. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness is a pursuit of living a life that forces us to live life differently, to do things differently, to do things in such a way that people would look at us and say, there's something wrong with you. There's something messed up in the way you think. There's something that says you are not normal. 
because Jesus Christ was not normal. Everyone noticed his life was different. Everyone noticed he did things differently. And he was in relationship with the Father in such a way that you couldn't tell where Jesus ended and God began. Right? I and the Father are one. If we want to have that kind of a relationship with God, if we want to be in that kind of connection, union with God like Jesus has with God the Father then we have to pursue righteousness, that right way of living, that doing life worthy of God and Christ with such hunger and thirst that it is a craving that drives us to pursue it, that we thirst for it so much that when we don't have it, it hurts not to have it. Big words there. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. They do righteousness, and they are blessed. Secondly, the merciful. We read merciful, and we read it as a character quality. We read it as a personality trait in our day and age. But that's not what the Greek means. The Greek means a merciful person is a person who is a giver of mercy. A merciful person is somebody who is active in mercy, who goes out of their way to give mercy, to give aid to those who are suffering, to give help to those who are in need. A merciful person in the New Testament was somebody who lived their life in such a way that they extended themselves to anyone that they saw in need. They extended themselves to anyone who was suffering. They gave of themselves to that person. That was a merciful person person it wasn't an interior quality it was an exterior extension it was a it was a moving of them into that other person's life it is a motivation to change that other person's circumstances to do something to make a difference in that life mercy people who give mercy are blessed because they're doers of mercy the third one Those who are pure in heart. To be pure in heart means to be free from guilt in here. To not have a burden of guilt in our life. To not walk around wondering or worrying over what we've done wrong. Purity is a a difficult position to, to defend in the modern church. The idea of being pure is so hard to preach and convince people of its importance. But, I mean, we've all heard the saying, right? Nobody's perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. Therefore, I don't have to make the effort. That's the understood part of that, isn't it? I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, when people say that, that's the part they leave off. They don't say, only Jesus is perfect, period. There's a comma at the end. But here's the thing. Purity is in the foundation of Old Testament theology. Old Testament theology rests on the idea of purity. What was the purpose of the sacrifices? What was the, what was the, the, the fulfillment of the law? What was the idea of being in righteous connection with God? To be a pure people, to be a priesthood, to be a people who were right in their relationship with God, free from guilt. And the the New Testament theology promises it all over the place. It's a real thing in this life to be perfect, to be pure, to be sanctified, to be holy right here in this life. If we say that purity is an impossibility, then why do we read the Bible that rests so much upon it? If people believe that purity is just some some fanciful that we can can live out there, then we might as well call the resurrection a fantasy as well. Because they go side by side. Purity is a necessity in the Old Testament. It's a promise in the New Testament. People who are pure in heart 
are people who have experienced a freedom from guilt. And so the pure in heart, they live their life so that they will do no wrong, but when they make the errors, they go back and fix them. People who are pure in heart seek to live their life without failing, seek to live their life the best way, seek to live their life so that they don't make those mistakes. But when they make those mistakes, they don't just try to sweep it under the rug or blame somebody else. They stand up and they say, this is my fault. I have sinned. And then they do what they can to make the corrections, to make the reconciliation, to bring restoration so that the guilt can be removed pure in heart, are blessed. And they do purity in their relationships. The last one, the peacemakers. Peacemakers is easy to figure out why they're the doers because all you got to do is flip it on its head. The peacemakers are makers of peace. And if there's one thing this week has shown us, there's one thing the last month has shown us, this is a job requirement that needs a lot of filling. This is the one that probably needs more applicants than any of the others. Peace needs to be made now. We are in a broken world that does not know peace. We need makers of peace working right now and doing what they can to bring this blessing into the world. Because there's not enough of them. There's not enough people doing this in the world. Stop and think about what, you know, how we consider this season, Advent and Christmas, how peace, you know, is woven through in it, throughout it. You know, Jesus is called the Prince of Peace in the Old Testament. We celebrate Advent and Christmas as a time of peace, but peace is not the crowning quality of Christianity. If there are any qualities that are tagged to Christianity, if we hashtag the church with anything, is peace in the top ten? No. It's not. In fact, it's really down the list so much that people think that the church has no peace to offer. and We bring no peace into the world. Gary said that there are circumstances today, this is a religious issue. I know people who write who think they're smarter than me who say that the church, Christianity, is one of the reasons why there is no peace in the world right now. How far down the list is peace right now in the church? We need makers of peace. We need these kind of people in the church right now because makers of peace go out of their way at expense to their own comfort or their own quality of life to bring peace into the relationships that they have, into the communities they are a part of, into the world which we all belong to. Makers of peace do something with their life to make peace happen. Stop and think about in the last hundred or so years, who are the great peacemakers? Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, the greats. And stop and think for just a moment about their life. How much did they give up to be known as a maker of peace? Did they live lives of comfort? No. Did they have a good quality of life? They were willing to sacrifice those things to go into the world and extend this idea that peace is a necessity in our relationships, in our communities, in our world. Were they perfect? No. But they tried to make the difference. They tried to do what they could to make peace. Blessed are the peacemakers because they do make peace. Now here's where things get really interesting. You take these four peoples who are doers. The hunger and the thirst for righteous, the merciful, the, um, I get to running so fast that I can't think of things, the pure in heart and the peacemakers. You take these four doers, but then you look at what Jesus promises them. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. The promised blessing of each one of these could be directly related to the work that they do. What God, Jesus, promises those doers of blessing 
may be a direct outcome of what they are doing as blessings. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, they are satisfied with the fullness of a life worthy of God or Christ. Stant loves, to, loves the word here for satisfied in the book. Okay? It's really a cool word. Cortazo, I think is what it is. I don't have it memorized. Do you know the feeling that you had after Thanksgiving dinner and the second piece of pie? That feeling where you said, okay, the belt's got to come off and there's a recliner with my name on it. You know those for, that feeling? That's the Greek word. To be satisfied, to be fat and sassy with it. Imagine what being satisfied with the fullness of a life worthy of God, worthy of Christ. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied with righteousness. That which they hunger and thirst for, that which they crave, that which is painful in, its, in the seeking out of it, they're going to be fat and sassy with that. They're going to be so full of it. I don't mean that in a bad way. They're going to be so full of righteousness, they will not want anymore. The second one, the givers of mercy will receive in kind what they have provided. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. They spend their life giving and giving and giving and giving until finally, when it comes to the fulfillment of that blessing, God says, you have given so much of yourself. Now let me give to you. Let me take care of you. Let me fulfill you. For those who are pure in heart, they will be invited into that holiness, that separate, that, that, that idea of God being cut off from, from humanity. The Old Testament lived under the understanding. No one could see God and live. And yet the pure in heart will be invited into the presence of God. This is where I like to say that heaven will be a great big barbecue. Everybody will be invited in. Everybody is going to be drawn in. The pure in heart will be able to sit right there at the feet of God and enjoy that presence completely. The makers of peace will be called princes and princesses of peace along with Christ. Listen to what it says here. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. What do we call the Son of God in this time of year? The Prince of Peace. Those who are peacemakers will be called Prince of Peace. Princess of Peace. Right along with Christ. What these people do will bring the fulfillment of their own blessing into their life. What they do for others God is going to pour back into them. How great is that as a blessing? How great is it to know that that which we do, God will come back along and reaffirm that in our life. But let's take this idea and let's crumple it up and let's throw it to the side for just a minute. Let's take the Old Testament and, and put it away and let's go back to the contemporary and think about that for just a minute. Let's go back to blessing being the idea of fortunate or lucky or being prosperous. But let's look at it from a biblical point of view. If we do that, we see that there are responsibilities for the blessed in a contemporary understanding. If we are fortunate, if we have a life that is full of good things, Jesus calls us to share those things. For those to whom much has been given, much will be required. We have repeated stories of, of, of examples of people who have been given something and that they are supposed to share that with others. For people who are lucky because they have certain positions or they have certain things in life that others don't have, Jesus doesn't say, well, we'll sit back on your laurels and enjoy that. He says, lead, go out there, be in front of others, show others what life can be like. Take them alongside and give them a glimpse of what that can be. For those who are prosperous, and we are prosperous, 
We live in the most prosperous nationality of people in the world. We have more than we know what to do with. The prosperous have the resources to change the lives of others. And Jesus says, give it away. If you look through the New Testament, if you look through the Gospels, if you look through how Jesus speaks on fortune and luck and prosperity, we see that they have responsibility also. So whether we look at it from an Old Testament perspective, we look at it from a contemporary perspective, we know this. Jesus doesn't call people blessed that they can be recipients of blessings. Jesus calls them blessed who can do something to bless others. That's what blessing means. That's what he does when he takes on this idea of blessing people. Either way, we use the term blessed. We have to see that it comes with responsibility. That there's a part that we play in making a difference in people's lives. Like I said, next week we're going to talk about the other part of that list. The people who have experienced things. I'm titling it curses as blessings because many of the people in that list they don't have what we would consider to be a good life but those of us who have a good life we have been called to something more we've been called to those who do not have the blessed life and it's our task our responsibility to do something